Hey Button Dragons, welcome back to my channel. I am so glad you could be here today. We're here to talk about why you should read The Winter Night Trilogy by Katherine Arden. Let's go. So I read the Winter Night Trilogy probably faster than I have ever read a trilogy before. It is just so engaging, so immersive, and uh, I, I just had a blast. So because I enjoyed the trilogy so much, I want to impress upon you, my wonderful followers, why you should read the Winter Night Trilogy. I'm going to talk about the setting, I'm going to talk about the characters, and I'll talk about the magic, and I'll talk about the prose and story structure. So let's start with the setting. The story is set in medieval Russia, and the Khans are in power. So the rulers of Russia at the time are vassals to the Khans. And so if the Khans say jump, the, the Russians jump, and there, there is a sense of distaste for the servitude that they have toward the Khans, but most people don't really want to rock the boat and go to war with the Khans and things like that. But there's a small contingent of people that do, and, and so you, you've got a lot of a lot of imbalance there. You've got a lot of uncertainty, uh, a lot of fear and anguish that is coming about because of the cons being in power. And the, the cons are looked at as infidels. They're, they're looked at as heretics, pagans, if you will, even. Uh, and, and mostly because of the influence of the Orthodox Church. The Orthodox Church is... A, a strong power center in medieval Russia at this time and it, its influence is growing steadily and uh, they're, they're exerting their influence. Uh, the priests are winning over a lot of people to the faith and, and making promises that things will be better under the rule of the church. And so not only is the church promoting the removal of the cons, but also they are heavily against the folk religions of medieval Russia. So that's the setting that we come into, and, and it's just really, really fascinating. So this is mostly a historical fantasy. There is a heavy amount of information brought in from history but there is also a very heavy influence of folk religion, uh, Russian folklore, on this story. And so you do have a lot of magic and mysticism that heavily permeates this story. And I think it just does it amazingly. It doesn't feel like you are reading a historical novel. It really doesn't, or at least it didn't to me. So let's talk a little bit about the characters uh, leading in from that, because the characters are really what drive this book, and, and I loved that part of it. Some of the characters are historical. You've got the Grand Prince of Russia, Prince Dmitri, who was a historical figure in real life. And of course, we know the Khans are historical figures at this point in time. So there's, uh, there's no question that that's uh, part of the historical backdrop there. But then you've got a lot of other characters that are woven into the mix as well to, to fill in the story elements. And we'll talk about some of the others. Uh, starting with one of my favorites, the main character, Vasilisa Petrovna. She is the daughter of one of the boyars who serves the Grand Prince. And unlike the rest of her siblings, she is kind of a wild child. She is very closely attuned to nature and to the folk spirits that permeate the old world of Russia. And part of that is due to the fact that her mother 
was also kind of more in tune with nature and those spirits and her dying wish was that her daughter would be like her in that respect and in touch with the old ways and able to take hold of some of the magics of the natural world. And so her dying wish, of course, came true. And Vasya, uh, which is one of the names she's also known by, a nickname, uh, Vasya was born with that kind of spiritual touch. And, and, and Vasya is just a fascinating character. She grows so much over the course of these three books from a, a younger preteen girl to uh, an adult toward the end of the series and just constantly fighting the expectations that are put upon her to be a traditional woman, to marry and bear children and work in the home and do the things that every good woman of a Russian household would do. And that, that's one of the things I loved about this story. It didn't stay stuck to the old, archaic, outdated ways of how women were treated in the day. Even though that was there, it's an element in the book. There are characters who, who are definitely stuck in the mindset the male is the head and, and, and the women are to be subservient and everything like that. But Vasya herself is a wild spirit and she's not going to be tied down to anybody's beliefs about what a woman is supposed to be. In fact, she openly defies that belief time and time again. So much so that at one point they're they're about ready to ship her off to a convent to to get her under control because you know, it, it's obvious she's not going to be able to make any man happy. And so they, they're just going to ship her off to a convent. But she's got other plans in mind. And I just love how the story unfolds around her powerful spirit of, of individuality and connection with the, the nature spirits. It, it was just a magnificent tale centered around Vasya. But there are other really great characters as well. Her sister Olga, or Olya, she, it's used inter interchangeably. She is a subservient woman, and, and yet she also defies the expectations on women, but in more of a silent way. So I, I really enjoy getting to know Olga's character. At the very beginning, you have Vasya's father, Pyotr Vladimirovich, uh, being a boyer serving the Russian prince. He has some expectations on himself as well to, to manage a household and bring glory to Russia and, and things like that. And so once his wife dies, you know, he remarries and he remarries a woman who is very steeped in the doctrines of the church and is very antagonistic against Vasya. So you, you've, got, you've got those struggles there that Vasya is dealing with in her own family and those personality clashes and power clashes that are happening. And, and it's just excellently executed, I personally believe. And then you've got one really strong antagonist in the story and that is one of the Orthodox priests Konstantin Nikonovich, and he has been sent from Russia to be the household priest for Vasya's family and for her village. This, this guy is so conflicted and in many ways so susceptible to suggestion, but he's got his own ideas of how to uproot and dissolve the power of the old religions and strong arm the village into the church. And it's just, it's frustrating to watch at times, but frustrating in a satisfying way. He's one of those characters that you love to hate. And, and I did hate him. I mean, I was just, 
he's absolutely despicable, but he's a fantastically written character. So uh, Constantine was a, a very, very strong antagonist uh, throughout the whole series. Uh, not so much in book two, but definitely in books one and three. Just a, a really great character. And then you've got the Chierti. At least I think that's how they're pronounced. And that and those are the nature spirits themselves. Uh, each household has its own spirit uh, that, that lives in the oven. And you've got other nature spirits like water spirits and uh, stable spirits that, that help you learn how to talk to horses. And, and this is where the real magical aspect comes into the story. It's all centered around those nature spirits. And because people are starting to become stronger in the Orthodox faith, they are starting to believe less and less in the household spirits and, and the village spirits and such. And so those spirits are starting to lose power and fade away. Um, the, the strongest of those spirits are the Winter King, Morosco, who is also death in this story. He is one of the protagonists in the story, although he's kind of an anti-hero in many ways. And I thought it was interesting to see death portrayed as a protagonist in the story, but it... It was just beautifully done, and, the, and there's a love interest there as well between, between Vasya and, uh, and the Winter King that is really interesting and, and heartwarming. I, I, just, um, I, I just loved it, and I, th I think you will too. If, if, if you like love interests in fantasy, which I know many people do, I think you'll really like that. But... Uh, You've got Morosco and his twin, Medved, who is the life spirit, but he gives an unnatural sort of life. It's a kind of life that creates walking dead creatures, specifically vampires, uh, or the, the Russian equivalent of the vampire, the Upir, is the spirit that creates them, and then humans become vampires as a result. And, the, and they kind of spread their infection. Uh, that was just fascinating. I, I love a, a good vampire story, so that, that was just fascinating to watch. But Medved is the, the bearer spirit, and he is he's the one who brings violence, and he thrives in the summer as opposed to his brother Morosco, who thrives in the wintertime. And a, a fascinating balance between the two and how you eventually come to realize that that you can't have one without the other you need that balance in nature and in life but but there's there's this silent and not so silent war going on between the two of them uh, and it was just fascinating to watch that unfold uh, there's also a character who is based on a, a russian myth Kashe the Deathless, and he is a character who has happened to evade the clutches of death for probably thousands of years by, by storing his soul in another vessel. And just fascinating to watch that part of the story unfold as well. So if you like stuff like that, I think you really like this story. Another antagonist that we meet in this story is Chelebi. He's one of the members of the Khan army and he plays a central role in this story too. I, I really enjoyed his character and um, just booing him the entire time that he was being uh, so awful to so many of the my favorite characters in the story and uh, the way he tried to rule with an iron hand and his goal was to eventually get rid of the Prince of Russia and become the ruler himself in his stead. So uh, that was a really interesting political scenario that was happening there. And so all this maneuvering is happening behind the scenes politically, and it just makes for a fascinating read. 
And then you do have animal companions in this story. Uh, one of my favorites was Salovi. I, I won't talk a lot about him because I'm, I'm going to get to him in the magic area, but he, he was a really wonderful character. I love good animal companions, and I thoroughly enjoyed all of the parts of the book that involved Salovi. Just a really fascinating character. So let's talk about the magic in this book. Because a, a big thing for me in fantasy books is magic. I love a good magic system. And this one is so unique, so heavily centered on Russian folklore and mysticism. So I mentioned the Kierti earlier, uh, the house spirits and the stable spirits. And they're very much this world's version of the Fae. So they are akin in many ways to Fae creatures that you read about in other stories that are more focused on medieval Europe and Celtic mythology. Uh, but, but they do have a little bit different role because they are very closely tied to the locations that they serve. So, uh, for instance, the, the stable spirit is the one who teaches Vasya to talk to horses and to speak their language. Uh, so that was really cool to see. And, and then Vasti was able to pass that on to a couple of different characters. But it, it, it was just really neat to see how the Kierti are hesitant to deal with humans, but they begin to slowly realize that Vasti is on their side and, and she's their friend. And so they began to show themselves more readily to her and to teach her things and to, to bring her into the fold of their magic, so to speak. You've also got magical horses, which Salovi is one of those uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, I won't go too much into detail with him, but uh, just to say he's a really, really cool character, and he is very closely tied to the nature magic as well, because he is not just a horse. He is a very special horse, and I'm going to leave it there. But if you like animal companions, you have to love Salovi. I, I just can't imagine why you wouldn't. There is also another magical horse in the story whose very nature is the element of fire. This horse doesn't play a huge role in the story, but it's a big enough part of the story that that just had me completely fascinated. I just loved the, the small part that that horse played in the story. I will say that it does involve changelings. And we'll leave it at that. And then you've also got portals to different aspects of the world. So you've got the real world, and then you've got a succession of many different midnights that can be traveled to through special portals. And they are kind of ruled over and coordinated by another Kierti known as Midnight. Uh, she's got a different name, but I, I can't remember it. And, it. and it was frankly kind of hard to pronounce. So I'm just going to call her Midnight. But she plays a key role in the final book of the series. And Vasya learns to travel the portals of midnight to traverse the outer world and grow in her magical power and things like that. That, that part was just absolutely fascinating. Uh, the character of Baba Yaga, the old witch woman, plays a role in this story as well. She's another character from Ro Russian myth. Uh, and she plays a very key role in Vasya's story. So I won't say any more, but once you read the story, you'll, you'll see exactly what I mean. Just absolutely wonderfully done. I'm going to stop gushing about magic because I could go on and on and probably spoil way too much for you if I keep going on about the magic. But needless to say, if you love a magic system that is based in folk magic, you will love this magic system. And so now I want to talk a little bit about the story structure and the prose. I will say right off the bat, this 
series is a very easy read. Each of these books I read, I, I think at the most it took me four days for one book. They're, they're that quick and that engaging. Uh, the prose is not overly flowery, but it's beautiful and immersive and very atmospheric. You really get the sense that you are right in the story. And I don't mean just in the story. Yeah, yeah I'm walking along with the characters. I mean, you're feeling the elements. The, the way the author describes the elements of the story, the backdrop, the, the frozen winter backdrop of medieval Russia in the backwoods and the forests, among the trees and the shadows and the darkness. You, <laughs> at least I almost felt like I needed to wrap a blanket around myself to keep myself warm. And maybe it was just the air conditioning in the apartment was just set too low and I was freezing. But nonetheless, I, I felt right in the story so much so that I, I felt like I was in the frozen dead of winter in the Russian forests. I, I It just, it, it was that atmospheric. So I loved Catherine Arden's writing style and I just, it, it was just such that I could not put it down. I kept wanting to get to the next thing and the next thing and I'm like, okay, okay, what happens now? What happens now? I, I just, I couldn't put it down. And that's one reason it took me so quick to get through the trilogy. So. Uh, so yeah, the, the the prose is absolutely amazing, and and it flows. It just flows beautifully. So fantastic story, and, and the way she constructed the story, building upon the elements from the previous books each and every time, uh, as she as she tells the story of Vasya throughout. It, it just flowed beautifully. There there was never a time where I thought. Oh, I could have done without that passage. I felt like everything was key to the story. So now that I've gone through all of these things, I, I just want to end by kind of summing up my thoughts. Uh, the historical backdrop and the setting of this story was just brilliantly done and brilliantly executed. The characters were so well built and fleshed out, uh, especially Vasya. I, I just, I just felt like I was completely involved in her world. Uh, the magic system was breathtaking at times, and it was always immersive for me. And and the prose and the story structure just worked so well to engage me as a reader. So um, this is one of my top series of all time, I think. I will probably reread it several more times at least. Uh, uh, and you know, maybe maybe next time I'll pick up the audiobook, but um, I highly recommend that you read it. Have you read this series? I would like to know that. Let me know in the comments. Uh, have you read it? What did you think of it? If you have not read it, do you want to read it now? I hope you want to read it now. And uh, yeah, let, let's have a chat in the comments and see what we come up with. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them to me. I am going to include a spoiler section in the comments down below. And that's all I've got to say about this series, guys, uh, without spoiling just everything for you. But I am going to be doing a spoiler-filled discussion, wrapping up the Winter Night Trilogy with some other booktubers, uh, some of whom I did a discussion with before, and I will link that discussion at the end of this video. If you want spoilers for The Bear and the Nightingale, we do talk about that there, so I'll, I'll leave a link there. And that's it, guys. Make sure you are reading more books. We'll talk soon.